Hey, Jim. <laughs> and he loves it. He loves his stuff. You know, he wrote me about that too. So, anyway, uh, the, the record company that I started, uh, you can call it a company, you're basically looking at the record company. Uh, it's called Science Sonic Laboratories. And the idea is kind of melding science and science fiction elements with creative music. And I mentioned Richard Powers before. We, we have an agreement to use Richard Powers' art on all our covers. And I collect original Richard Powers paintings, too. So if anybody out there has any in their basement getting water damage, let me know. But uh, we have the two releases of Science Sonic Laboratories here, Live at Space Farms and Nucleus, kind of science fictional music in a way. And I'm interested to see if any of the Doc Savage people are drawn to that side of things. So we got our t-shirts and all of that back there too. And if you buy all three CDs, you get $5 off. But for this, obviously I had to have a different, this is a standalone thing, I had to have a different look, different package, so I created Doctone. He's all over it. <laughs> created Doctone as a subsidiary of Science Science Laboratories just for this project. And of course I hope to do a volume two and uh, in another ten years. In another ten years. <laughs> you know, how many of us are alive for that one? Um, and you know I've just been hatching this idea of a book novel C D music combination. <laughs> so that would be 20 years down the road. Uh, so the CD finally uh, was manufactured, and I had a big party, and I had the guys come over, and I, I brew home, I brew beer in my basement. So I made a batch of beer to celebrate the occasion. I said, let me put every bronze thing in it I can think of. So we use amber malt, brewer's gold. Um, Put roasted pumpkin in there, flax seed. I forget what else. And we made this. We made this. I made this bronze nemesis ale, and you know what came out actually really good. And I bottled it. I made special labels, color fast labels that are essentially the the CD cover. Except if you look closely. Doc is holding us a mug of beer, a mug of frosty beer in his hand, in his fist. And it says here, he's quoted on here, just the ticket after a tough day of punishing evildoers. <laughs> Scotty's bronze nemesis really satisfies. Doc's fat. <laughs> and I had special caps made. These are, these are professionally, uh, professionally made uh, Doc Savage bottle caps, and I made one batch only, and I gave one to everybody in the band. I gave one to the cover artist, Dan Philippone, who did the background cover, which matches the uh, photo in the lab, and I gave one to the graphics person and all of that, and I brought this one bottle here, so it's being raffled, so any of you want to take it home, Put your bid in the box. This is a truly rare item. I can tell you that. And it's drinkable. And it comes with a sturdy box and bubble wrap. I brought it in my luggage. It'll be fine. That's the story with that. Uh, I'll introduce just a few little sounds. I didn't go crazy and bring saxophones and seven-foot instruments and wind machine. But I brought a few of the little things. You know, Doc Savage was famous for his little devices, right? All kinds of little things. And uh, I wanted to have some fun with that. So the, the, the first piece on the album is called Man of Bronze. Initially, I wasn't going to use that title because it's not that evocative, really, compared to the others. And it's kind of too obvious to use Man of Bronze. But so I wrote all this other material. But then I started thinking about how it all has to go together as a program and how it has to unfold. And that's when I realized, you know what, I do need a piece that serves to kind of introduce the character in a way and sort of start the whole thing off. So I, had to, I did have to end up writing Man of Bronze, which I did last. Um, 
at least of the initial batch of material I did that last. And uh, so I think maybe we'll play for maybe the first two people. Let me ask you this. How many people here, if anyone has, has seen my YouTube video of The Secret of the Sky and heard that piece? Only two. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. So then we, we can listen, we can listen to that here and see, see what you think. But we're going to play the first two songs, <coughs> "Man of Bronze," and then there's a but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a bass solo, a long uh, unaccompanied bass solo, and that leads into the secret in the sky. When we did the initial performance of this material for the Jazz Composers Collective in New York City. There were no announcements, and so every piece led into every piece in the form of a suite. Um, but before you play that, I'll just demonstrate. Just I thought it might be fun just to actually play a little bit of musical sound here. So the Man of Bronze, it, it starts out with this kind of, uh, it's very dramatic, a lot of low tones, a uh, suggestion of great strength in the bass saxophone and the trumpet cymbals, brassy, low, strong sound to kind of introduce the idea, and it's, it's almost like Doc Savage is striding into the room. And then he stops. It, there's a couple of these little inter, interludes where it's as if Doc Savage stops and reaches for one of his gadgets, you know. So I brought a couple of those gadgets, and we'll see what you think. I think the first one, uh, I think the first one that's heard is this little box. This is a photoelectric ceremony. How in the world do you know how to manipulate that sound? I was going to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, got, uh, it's got several controls, and it's got a little electric eye, which is actually light sensitive. You know, if I turn it on, and if I don't do anything else, if I don't touch any of the other controls... Wait, I'll give it more volume. <laughs> See, that's just from that's just from how much light. Is in I, I want to I want to hear how much sound is coming off his forehead. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> we'll we'll you do that, that later. Some of that's not reminiscent of his trilling. Well, that's that's not my CD. <laughs> this, this is actually what it is. You're just trying to move. I worked very hard to create a mood. <laughs> yeah, he uses it. You use it for the trilling, right? No. Oh, sorry. Wrong instrument. <laughs> Wrong instrument. No, but it's used in the Man of Bronze. It's just like some weird little device that he reaches for. That's all. But how long did it take you to know how to get the sound you wanted? With Probably like with guitar music. feedback. You know, something like this. You turn it on, and right away, it's, wow. You know, and then you turn the knob, and it goes. So I mean. 
I imagine you have an idea what you want to do before you start. So yeah, you know, you have to something like that. He'll sit and play this for a long. Yeah, here, honey, I'm going shopping. It plays me and I play it, but it's cool, right? And it sounds like a weird little scientific device that somebody would use, you know. So there's that photoelectric ceremony. And then uh, there's another little gadget, that, that, there's another little interlude where uh, I, I had the drummer just play cymbals. I said, just play only the cymbals and play this little solo on the cymbals. And then I'm going to pull out this little gadget, and this is very effective when we do it live. I'm going to pull out this little gadget, and it's going to make this sound. And when the sound stops, you cut off with the cymbals. So it goes like this. He's playing. And then I go like this. And it's like a cool little device. And it makes a great sound. And it's a bit, I got this in Japan. It's a keychain. It's a big fish. And it, it swallows the little tiny fish on the end of the line. And when it swallows the fish, the sound stops. So I use this not only for its sound, but it becomes a, a, a kind of a conducting tool, you know? And the drummer's watching it, and when the fish goes chomp, chomps all the sound off. <laughs> nice. Audiences love stuff like that. <laughs> and you can fit it in your little vest pocket. <laughs> Something like almost everything else. Uh, okay, at the end of that piece, um, my wife mentioned the trilling. Now, this is a kind of... Uh, this is, runs through all the Doc Savage books that he makes this unconscious sound, this eerie little sound that kind of flutters up and down the scale, right? Right. Is there any, has there ever been any kind of audio uh, rendition of that? Was it used in the radio? It was show? used in the movie last night. All of our radio it plays. Stupid, though, so it was in the movie, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it doesn't sound anything like a human yeah. sound could make. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 they they put it in the released radio plays that they did, but uh, you know Roger Rittner said it was the one thing about the shows that he felt they never got right. Mm -hmm. What did they use for that for the radio? Play? I forget what what they used. He he said in the in the little piece afterwards he talked about it, but I can't remember. He said they tried a lot of things though. One of the guys tried to do it vocally and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. But what they ended up and they thought about throwing it out, but. In the end, they thought they had to use something. Right. But he said that was the one thing they weren't happy with. So yeah. We'll what see you how use, you Jay? did. <laughs> Jay, what did you use on our radio plays? <clears throat> well, I wish I had one with me. I could play it real quick for you. I had one in the car. It was, it was a, a, a jungle bird, and then I slowed it way down, and then huh. uh, added echoplex and all sorts of things to it. And that it sounds like it sounded trilling, whether yeah. it sounded like Doc or not, I don't know. <laughs> Sir, <is it> <laughs> well... This is what I used. It's interesting you said bird because I used this this little bird whistle. I love this thing. I've had this for many years. Now I've since decided, yeah, you know, I went through a lot of my gadgets at home and I, I, ended, I ended up using this. And the, and the trilling sound comes in at the very end of Man of Bronze, right before the bass solo. And then it goes into Secret in the Sky. So. This is what I use. I've since decided that this is too high pitch. You know, I recently reread The Pirate's Ghost and it calls it a low sound, a low eerie trill. So, I think I have to rethink. You know, maybe it should be done vocally. Like, I thought it meant low in volume, not pitch. Right. Maybe it should be something like that with reverb on it. But it changed based on his emotion. It changed all the time in the stories based on what it, what it meant emotionally. So it could be anything. <coughs> yeah, because they talk about sounding like wind through ice pinnacles. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So they really wanted to make it sound like whatever that You can describe like. it a lot easier than you could, like... Yeah. You can say it, but you can't figure out what it, it is. <laughs> uh, Ooh, say it you nice. rhyme it. Uh, That's right. What I did is actually more of a flutter. I do a flutter effect in my throat, which is not really a trill. But lay people, you know, non-musical people use these kinds of words interchangeably anyway. So uh, I'm not sure that it really has to be <clears throat> has to be a trill as opposed to flutter. I don't know.
Yeah. You're already ahead of the movie. <laughs> I'm already ahead of the movie. Oh yeah. <laughs> in fact, you got to send that to the fan dub guy and let him cut a new version with that over it. You know. Well, I think I need to look for one of these about this big. <laughs> Get a low. I think if it was lower, it might be to take. Oh, or I could slow it down. You know, mm -hmm. you could slow it. Down. Anyway, that's what I did. Well, that was the trilling effect, and then I brought uh, a couple other sounds. And one of the pieces on it, one of the very involved pieces on the album, is called the Metal Master. Nice. And for this one, I really. This is the one piece that has a kind of a danceable rhythm in it but in a very twisted, weird way. And uh, I went really scientific on this because of the nature of that novel and what the, what the menace is all about, and there's a lot of science in it. <clears throat> it's one of the great things about the Doc Savage stories in the first place. So I, for this one, I, I, took, uh, I did a little research into physical properties of all these different metals. I go into this in quite some detail in, in his book, so I won't bore you with it now, but it has to do with electrons and density and all kinds of things. And I generated this mathematical information for a whole variety of different metals, including bronze, which is an alloy, and, and then I used these mathematical re relationships for each metal to determine a sound for that, a sonic area for that metal. Um, the density of the clusters in the piano that lie underneath the melodic information, the phrasing of the melodic information and how many notes are used, all of this is derived from scientific properties of different metals. And then interspersed through that piece are interludes of just pure metal sound. And this is one. All the music just kind of stops, and then you hear this thing. <laughs> Sounds better than some automobile part you found yeah. in the street. <laughs> yeah, but there's probably an acronym we could make out of that. Yeah. <laughs> in, in the middle of the piece, the music goes on and there's a sudden shocking thing where all the rhythm just suddenly, everything stops and there's this giant maelstrom of metal, this giant, it just starts on a dime. We have all these tubes, all this stuff hanging, there's metal everywhere, scrap metal pieces. <clears throat> Everyone in the band has some kind of metal, and it's just this giant sound, and then that slowly dies out and the music resumes, and then at the very end it goes into this kind of rhythmic groove where everybody stops playing their instruments and just starts playing on chairs and pieces of this and this and that, and it gradually just kind of goes into dissolution, which is what happens in the stories, all the metal breaks down, right? And, uh, and then the very last song you hear is... that. And you can move it around in the space and create stereo panning effects that sound electronic, but they're not. They're just done in the air with this, this thing kind of pulses the sound. That's how it ends. There, I gave it away. <laughs> so those are a few of my little toys and devices. Thank you for listening. You want to hear a couple tracks? Yeah. 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 So, uh, so uh, then we're going to hear, uh, I guess, uh, The Man of Bronze and then followed by The Secret in the Sky, which uses the Mode theorem I was talking about.